channel. It's Chris Hero, ladies and gentlemen. Chris is awesome. You know what it is. Chris Hero, welcome to the Twitch stream. Man, thank you for having me. What's going on? Uh, nothing much. Obviously, it's been a super busy <laughs> weekend, uh, and we know it's going to be a busy week for you as well. Thank you for making the time. Um, some familiar friends in chat. Uh, Charles from Wrestling Playlist saying, what's up? A um, lot of people in the chat. Very excited to get into this. Uh, as we mentioned, it's Mania weekend. Uh, were you in town in Philly, perhaps working Supercard of Honor or something? Uh, what, were your, what was your Mania weekend like this year? Yeah, so first of all, let me apologize for Susan. <laughs> um, she's very fascinated with what's going on right now. i to make sure I don't lose. <laughs> we love having uh, we her on Susan stream. Yeah, we have Susan, Gino, and Diana. Diana probably will not bother us, but Gino is very curious. And Susan just wants to know what's up. Um, so one, hello from them. Uh, we had uh, Worcester. We, we flew to Worcester on Tuesday. We had dynamite uh, and then an ice storm, an ice hail storm for, to get from Worcester back to Boston. Um, I, we all thought our flights were going to be canceled to Philly the next day. Got into Philly. Uh, and then we had Supercard, and then, strangely enough, I flew home on Saturday. Oh, um, okay. Wrestle, Wrestle, WrestleMania weekend for me typically is go from here to there to here to there to whatever and catch up with this person and catch up with that person. And I was spent, man, and I knew it was the week before uh, this big show coming up, and I needed as much time home as possible. Got to see a handful of people, didn't see a ton. Uh, but I just have been traveling so much the past just about nine months. Sure. Um, so I was I was good to come home, but uh, I really did enjoy my time, uh, especially in Philly. I saw a lot of people I hadn't seen for a while. So, yeah. and, you know, obviously you always meet people for the first time, too. So I really enjoyed that aspect of the weekend as well. Uh, is there ever a part of you that misses like the hustle and bustle, doing a million shows in one weekend, Mania weekend, all the buzz, even on uh, indie wrestling. Uh, is there an ever is there ever the, an itch to go back to that? Oh, for sure. Uh, I have very fond memories of that. I remember um, one specifically where Zach and I opened um, like a WWN showcase show, right? We were the first match on there. This was down in Texas, uh, 20... 16 uh and then he and i you know beat the shit out of each other and then we hopped in a car and uh drove to wrestle con for the super show there where we teamed uh with brian cage in the main event uh to take on the team of uh matt Sydal, ricochet and ray mysterio jr so wow. open one show close the other um yeah very very fond memories from all that i also remember wrestling masato tanaka um on one of those evolve dragon gate usa shows uh and then he and i hopped in a car to get over to the to the wrestle con show so a, lo a lot of good memories <clears throat> i don't miss the frantic uh the <laughs> stress um i don't miss that but you know what i get quite a bit of that as it comes whether it's on a wednesday or a saturday so uh and of course another wrestlemania weekend uh classic to bring up is uh your First proper match with Timothy Thatcher as well. Um, and we saw, of course, you made your in-ring return against Thatcher last year. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, just returning to the ring, you're about your four matches deep, uh, if we count the singles DQ against Adrian Quest. Uh, how's, I how, count it. Yes. I count it. <laughs> that is a separate one. Cage match sets, it's separate as well. Um, yeah, how... How have you been feeling so far in this return run? Like physically, mentally, where are you at coming back to the ring? I feel pretty good. Um, I don't feel as good as I can. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of work to stay physically and mentally ready for this, uh, especially with all my tasks that I have going on right now. Um, I've always been involved in some aspect behind the scenes, uh, as in, 
you know, I never just showed up, did my match and that was it. You know, I always had relationships with other wrestlers. Sometimes they were students. Uh, sometimes I'd pitch ideas. Sometimes I'd help out with finishes. Sometimes I'd help people put matches together. So I've always been involved, but it's been in an unofficial capacity. So this is just, uh, and, and it's learning on the job. Um, I think I am good at what I do, but there are just always these moments that come up and I'm just like, man, I should have known better or, uh, you know, I'll know better next time. So I'm far from being great at the coach slash producer job at the moment. Um, and there's just so much that goes into it. And I'm not somebody that can just do the bare minimum and be like, okay, you know, fuck it. I don't need to worry about that. Like I just, I care too much <laughs> to a, to a detriment where sometimes I have to snap myself out of it. And I'm just like, why am I spending so much time on this one thing? Um, but it, it drives me, it motivates me. Um, and as I work to get more matches under my belt, um, yeah, it just, uh, it, it's going to take some time and I appreciate everybody's patience one for waiting three and a half long ass years for me to have another match again. Um, I know a lot of people weren't sure if I was ever going to wrestle again. So <clears throat> one, thank you for your patience there, but also thank, thank you for your patience and allowing me to get back to the, um, the level that I know that I'm capable of. And, <clears throat> and the best way to do that is to put myself in there, um, with people that, that push me to be better. Uh, you, you mentioned the matches I've had so far, uh, you know, my first one was with Thatcher, you know, all time, great opponent of mine. Um, somebody that it's just so strenuous to go one-on-one -on -one with him. He's just so, uh, he's, a. I I said this in one of my interviews and I, I truly believe it. He's like pushing a boulder uphill, uh, where it looks like you're doing nothing, but oh my God, the sheer weight of that boulder. That's Tim Thatcher right there. Uh, then I followed that up two weeks later, two weeks later, what, what a quick turnaround. And I teamed with Kenta. A former, uh, you know, rival, um, former road dog of mine, Kenta, to take on Kevin Blackwood and Titus Alexander. So I got a little bit of taste of the of the current crop right now. And then I brought it back and wrestled Adrian Quest, uh, who is one of the suavecitos in West Coast Pro. <clears throat> and that was, uh, you know, run in on by by Ricky and Danny of the suavecitos. And then we were able to bring Titus came out to make the save. Uh, and then uh, we had a surprise where Konosuke Takeshita came out and surprised and we had a six man tag and just to stand on the apron alongside those guys like they're both I mean Takeshita what the hell right like come <laughs> yeah. on man what do you <laughs> I just every now and again I'll be walking down the corridor and I'll see him and I'll just give him a little shove because I'm like come on man quit it quit being <laughs> so in shape and and great and good looking and you know all come on man quit it and then titus titus is so like dynamic um he's grown up in the business uh, he has a good mind for it and he just has a, he has a really really strong passion for it i was so so stoked that he was able to go to japan last year and work for marvelous and noah um so my strategy is to put myself in the ring with people um that push me and motivate me um, obviously, you know, I want to have good matches too, and I want the fans to have good matches, but I, I think some of the opponents I've had, it's, you know, how can you not have a good match? Um, of course we mentioned Timothy Thatcher there. So just briefly, I wanted to ask some people in chat were curious as well. Uh, were you able to see, uh, action wrestling's Dean, uh, this past weekend, uh, tribute to a fallen member of the Death Valley driver, uh, review board, uh, were you able to catch that show? I was not able to watch the entire thing. I've I've skimmed through bits of it, and I did watch uh, Matt Mikowski versus Ares. Uh, you know, two of the guys that will be on my, my mixtape coming up. Um, you know, kind of a little bit of scouting on my behalf. But I mean, there's also I I heard rave reviews about Slim J versus Adam Priest, <clears throat> and I just appreciate uh, Phil Schneider, who I have communicated on and off with since Death Valley Driver. Um, a little backstory. Let me clear my throat real quick. <clears throat> so I'm not obnoxiously doing that into the microphone 10 times. Uh, I believe it was before the Ted Petty existed, before TPI existed, it was called the Sweet Science 16. Mm -hmm. And in the year 2000, uh, I was in that tournament. I actually won that tournament. Um, but uh, American Kickboxer introduced me to a guy that had come along with him that, that weekend. And his name was Mike Namark. And Mike 
uh, was like, Hey man, I, I, I contribute to this site called deathvalleydriver.com. And you know, in the back of my head, I'm, tw I'm 20 years old. I'm like, cool. That's a dumb name for a site. Right. <laughs> um, and I had no clue what stranglehold that, that message board would have on me for the next, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. Um, footage to, to the current generation, the people that have come up and started watching like in the last 10, 15 years, uh, footage was so hard to come by. And when you did get it, the quality wasn't great, right? So a lot of us just really relied on these auteurs, if you will, who would explain these matches, they would describe them. Um, and it's like, you know, they could make a, a bad match passable by the way they would describe it, or they'd make a good match great or a great match, you know, a once in a lifetime match. Like they were uh, like a visual soundtrack uh, to that era of wrestling for myself and many of my contemporaries. So Phil had reached out to me when I announced my show and he was like, dude, it sounds like we have some of the similar ideas when we're putting this show together. And I referenced the Schneider comps from death Valley driver. Uh, when I was explaining the show, it's like you pop on the tape and it's curated. So, you know, you know, you're, you're probably going to be in line and enjoy most of it, but it's going to be, uh, you know, something from, something from Michinoku, right? And then it's going to go to some kind of a bloodbath in Puerto Rico. And then you'll have uh, some interviews and an angle from Mid-South Wrestling. And and then it'll go up and there will be a WWF fan cam from The Garden. Um, there'll be some Calgary Stampede. Then we'll go back to Japan and we'll have some battle art. So there's just like a little bit of everything. I enjoyed those comp tapes so much. So when I was putting this show together and um, Scott from West coast pro kind of gave me free reign. I, I told him like, Hey, I want to, I want to do one of these shows. Like I'm, I'm curious what, what I have in here, how is that going to line up with the interests of, of our fans? And I thought I could really, uh, come up with some good stuff and, you know, obviously collaborate with some incredible talent to pull it off. So Phil had hit me up and was like, Hey man, um, I've got this show coming up and I, you know, shared it and, and talked a little bit about it. And I was just so glad they were able to all come together. And it's, it's not just about the show, or the matches, the quality of matches. It's about the camaraderie. And I saw they had, uh, you know, a chair saved for Dean. Yeah. Uh, and I, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that chair got dove into three or four times throughout the night. It was so blood just, stained before the night was over. Yeah. I just, um, I mean, that's what it's about, man. We've, uh, if you've been in this scene for any amount of time, uh, you've lost people. Uh, and it's, it's sad and it's hard to reconcile uh, it, because, 90, nine times out of 10, you're not going to see it coming. It's just going to come out of nowhere. And you never know the last time, not to get sappy, you never know if it's going to be the last time you see somebody. So I'm glad everybody was able to get together and have such a good time. So um, I will, I do look forward to sitting down and watching more of that show. Uh, you mentioned that you were doing a little scouting uh, for Matt Bukowski, uh, as well as Arez when you were checking out Dean. So I wanted to ask, what is your sort of like, what does your tape study habit look like now, especially as it re in regards to modern wrestling? Like, how do you keep up with uh, the wrestling of the day, basically? So now it is both easier than ever and harder than ever to keep up with things because everything's at your fingertips for the most part. Um, but where do you start? <laughs> right? So... Um, I, you know, I've got a billion bookmarks on Twitter. Uh, I have a billion saved to watch later on YouTube. Uh, you know, I have thousands of downloaded videos on, on YouTube premium that I can watch on my flights. Um, so I stuff does get lost in the shuffle and I hate it, but it comes from friends recommendations. Um, you know, I have a handful of people that i talk wrestling with pretty consistently and they'll tell me this or that or, or whatever. And I'll, I'll keep my eyes on some things like, um, completely out of the blue, uh, this luchador popped up at CMLL named Shelwa, right? It's X E X E L H U A Shelwa. Right. And he appears still to be somewhat inexperienced. You know, he's probably, 
I'm going to guess he's been around five, six years. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but he's just very creative. Um, he's not blow away, but that's the kind of stuff that I like, where it's the transition to go from a Casadora to this or a roll up from this or whatever. And, you know, I'm not watching the matches for, you know, to get lost as a fan in its entirety. Um, that's that's really hard these days, right? To watch a match start to finish and just kind of be locked in, especially when your brain works the way my brain does. I it's 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 hard, right? There's just a million things going on. But somebody like him uh, is like a guy that I first I saw some clips of him and I was like, oh man, what? Let me look this guy up. What's what's the deal? And then I went and followed him on on Twitter and I've seen some clips here or there. Uh, and then he was on a, a match the other day in Arena Coliseo. So I went and watched that, you know, like seven minute match and just found it kind of interesting. Um, I enjoy going back and watching World of Sport. I think I always will. Um, and especially now um, for the guys that are the less heralded, um, you know, I've, you know, I've seen countless Johnny St. matches or, or Johnny Kidd or Steve Gray or Zoltan Boschik or Terry Rudge. I've seen those guys countless times and I will go back and watch their matches, but it's the names that I'm not familiar with. And like, Oh, where was that guy from? Where, where did he do? And of course you have all the 50s, 60s, 70s catch stuff from France that showed up. Um, and I find that honestly, I find it a little overwhelming because <laughs> there's, there's so much of it. Um, and it's a bit of a miracle. We have it at all. Yeah, it is so incredible to have it, but I need a curator. I need someone to be like, hey, you know, whether it's Matt D or whether it's Charles or somebody that's like, hey, man, this is a really good one because of this. Uh, I, I talk with Charles all the time and I miss websites. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel so old saying that, but I miss um, you know, may, maybe not a message board, right? But I just miss being able to like Hey, there's these matches. I like this one because of this. I like this because of that. Watch out for this, whatever. Um, now it's everything is in such bite sized GIF format that it is really hard to kind of get your hooks synced in and, and check something out. But, um, and then so, like, when it comes to AEW, you know, I, I try to watch all of our shows. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but I do my best to watch as much as possible. It, it's crazy. You could be there for, nine ten hours one day and you could really only watch 15 to 20 minutes of the actual show just because there's so much going on or you kind of walk past a monitor and you see a little bit of it and then you know fortunately we can go back and kind of watch everything that's that's happened so i keep an eye on all that stuff um i try to keep my uh you know my my ears to the street when it comes in you know when it comes up, uh, whatever extras we have, whatever town we're in, where we are, you know, I take a look at the list of, of who's coming in so that I can have a little bit of familiarity with who's there. Um, and from a guy that used to pride himself in knowing like everything about everyone. Oh man, it'll, it's a reality check. There is just so much out there. There's so much. And it's easy to dismiss it and be like, well, if I haven't heard of them, you know, they must not be, you know, whatever. Right. That's like a prevailing thought amongst some people, but man, there really are some special pro wrestlers out there, you know, all throughout all um, eras of their career. Um, so yeah, man, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm always trying to watch stuff. I'm always trying to keep my ear on, uh, but then I also don't want to lose the enjoyment of it. I also want to watch stuff that I personally enjoy. Uh, you mentioned all the scouting, and of course, it is your pro wrestling mixtape coming up April 14th. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the the process of putting together this roster of names uh, that you have showing up uh, for your mixtape this week. So I started, I'm trying to think of when this was. Was it 2019? Was it 2020? I started a file in my phone of people that I had crossed paths with or people that I had, you know, admired from afar. Um, and I just kind of put them together in a list because every now and again, people would ask me like, Hey, what, you know, who, who, who's good now? Who's this, who's that, whatever. Um, and I love having an educated take on, Oh man, this guy's within driving distance. Like, uh, sh hit him up, you know, he'll probably be able to get some people in the car and, you know, give him, you know, here's a, here's his pinned tweet, um, that gives a little bit of a highlight video of him, whatever. 
uh, I love being able to do that. And I, I think I had just been asked a handful of times and I was kind of stumped of like, uh, you know, there wasn't anybody that was coming right to the forefront of my brain when I know there's, you know, dozens and dozens of, of great wrestlers out there, um, that are just right under the surface, you know, either they broke the surface long ago and have kind of settled or they're just on that cusp and they just need the right amount of people to see them the right people, the right places. So I kept the list to my phone of just these different people. And, um, so that it would just be a little bit easier for me to recall. And then as time went on and I was trying to figure out how I was going to make my return, who was I going to wrestle? What was I going to do? Where was it going to be? Um, just the thought of like, I originally wanted to do a branded show before I had my comeback match mm. and try to like maybe shoot an angle at that show that would lead to my comeback match. So that was kind of an idea I had at one point, but it just didn't end up working out. Um, so then it's like, all right, well, if I can book people <laughs> within reason, you know, uh, if I can book people within reason and Scott trusts me, um, and the, the wrestlers and the staff at West coast pro trust me, who would I bring in? Who deserves a shot? Who is someone that wouldn't be on the radar, uh, or who's someone that's on the radar or just hasn't had a chance to come back. Um, so I kind of started putting together kind of like a, a dream match list of like, I'd like to see this person and that person. And what about these guys? Or what about these girls? What about this? And, um, then you get into the whole thing of like, all right, we're actually going to do it. What's the date? Where's it going to be? Okay. It's going to be in LA on this date. Um, on this same day where deadlock is running the same day where prestige is running, um, the same day where, you know, there's just so many different companies out there that are running shows. So now it's, I can pick whoever I want, but they got to be available. Right. So, so yeah. So, uh, I just started reaching out one by one and I, I did the work, man. I went out and, you know, had, you know, probably 50 or 60 conversations with people about coming in and working the show and kind of, uh, letting Scott know a little bit about what was going on. But at the same time, he said, he trusts me. So it's like, all right, well, let's coordinate this. Um, so my whole thought with this show is let's give them a little bit of everything. Um, I love God pro wrestling really can be anything. Can't it? Right. There is no excuse to have four, five, six matches on the show that are all just so similar in structure, in, in like strategy and game plan, whatever you want to call it. Like that is, it's just, no matter how good they are, it just is fatiguing for your, for your audience to kind of see the same things and see the, uh, you know, the same dips, the same false finishes, the same stories. Um, so for instance, when I would, um, help produce these West coast shows. I would try to always tell everybody before every show. Uh, I don't think I was able to do it every time. There's just a lot going on, but like everybody that's booked on these shows is booked for a reason. Right. And what's the one thing that you can do that nobody else can do. And it's be you. What, the, what do you have that no one else have? You have you and your identity and what you bring to the game. So you don't feel like you have to keep up with the Johnsons where have to do these destroyers and these reverse Rana's and uh, brawl around the building and one kickouts and all these things, which in a vacuum can be good and great and great storytelling tools uh, and just the right move at the right time. Um, it's just, it's beautiful. Right. But how do we figure those things out? Right. Well, sometimes we pressure ourselves to do things that are a bit out of, what we do. So I just try to let everybody know like, Hey, you're, you're here. You're here for a reason. You're, you don't have to like earn a job, like just fucking go out there and, and do you the best you can. And then as long as you like care, as long as you like actually care about it. And as long as you are trying from show to show, like there's nothing more you can ask. Right. Um, those are, I think are the two strongest elements because if you go out there and you have a stinker of a match. Like, I don't want you to beat yourself up. I don't want you to, you know, have bad thoughts. 
Uh, but I do want you to go back to the drawing board and figure out like, oh, what could I have done differently in like a positive reinforcement kind of way, right? But if you, eh, whatever, eh, whatever, if you don't care, that tells me a little something's off. Either you're too scared to try or you don't love it enough to like really, really try. Um, and then as far as trying, that's the other part. It's like, we have to try things that are hard. We have to step out of our comfort zones to do better than we did before, to do differently than we did before. And you have to know this can't be like a constant thing. You can't be like trying the craziest thing every single time you have a match. You know, there are some people that do that and they're very fucking good at it, but <laughs> that's that's not the blueprint for everybody, right? So um, Hechicero, right, was a great example. Um, and I am such a massive fan of his, uh, that when he came and he had his match with Brian, um, I talked to him two different times earlier in the day and I said, Hey, just fucking be you, man. Just be you. There's only one Hechicero. You don't have to do topes. You don't have to do all these different Lucha spots and head scissors and whatever, like be you authentically you. And that's what will make you stand out. And holy shit. Um, it was just a TV match. Right. But I think people were like, Oh my God, who is this black magician? Like what is going on? Right. And of course he's in there with Brian, you know, the best in the world. So you can't really do any wrong. <laughs> um, there is one name on the talent lineup so far that, uh, really caught my attention. Uh, Kazusada Higuchi, uh, from DDT pro who, and it's interesting. DDT pro did run a mania show. He was not on that card. He will be on your card. Uh, so I wanted to ask, um, what was it about Higuchi that caught your eye? Um, how did you uh, get this to happen, that he'll be on your show? So if you have the access to it right now, uh, I just sent you a message uh, with a tweet. Uh, and I'd like you to pull up that tweet. Oh, boy. Don't mind. Let's check it out. Actually, uh, I'll send you a second one because one is in English, one is not. Oh, my God. All right, let's see what's going on here. <laughs> let's see if I can figure this out. Actually, let me put that in the chat. Oh, here it is, actually. All right, so for everyone in chat who is not seeing it right now, uh, tweeted out on the official DDT Twitter uh, accounts, Kazusada Higuchi has challenged Chris Hero for the pro wrestling mixtape. Um... Wow, that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty clear challenge there, Chris. Um, I'm hoping you will accept. Will you uh, <laughs> be kind enough to accept this challenge here on my Twitch stream? That would be incredible if you do. Well, there's no smoking in the venue in Los Angeles, so I don't know if that's going to be an issue for him. Um, <laughs> I I'm not sure when I first saw higuchi um i do know that on ddt's christmas eve show 2017 uh i was in the building um i went over uh with rachel that was rachel's first tour of stardom and she had a her first match uh in japan earlier that day so we hung around um if i'm not mistaken the main event was colt cabana versus Takeshita. my first time seeing Takeshita, and i believe that would have been the first time i saw higuchi um if, in person for sure i'm not sure if i'd seen video of him before um and i don't know man there was just something very striking about him he was very basic very solid um he's ex sumo right so they're just he carries himself in a different way so i had kept an eye on him and I kept thinking like, ah, oh, this guy's, if he gets in the right situation, he's going to break out. Um, and then, uh, you know, he kind of worked his way up the DDT ladder. Uh, he's had, he's shown that, you know, he's not just an ex sumo guy. He's not just a meat and potatoes pro wrestling uh, heavyweight. Um, he does have a lot of dimension to him. I believe he wrestled uh Walter, a.k.a. Gunther, at a, a WrestleMania weekend that put a couple more eyes on him. And he's taken pride in being the Japanese re representative. You know, there's so many people that want to become stars in Japan and use that as a springboard to travel the world, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but Higuchi is a kind of guy that's like, all right, I'm 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 the king of Japan. 
you know, come here and fight me. So the fact that he is able to come to the U S um, I'm very proud to have him on the show. And as far as him challenging me, I have to say that I accept guys, guys, y'all heard it here first. It's Higuchi versus hero on the pro wrestling mixtape, April 14. Um, Wow, that is quite a massive match. I am pretty sure many people in here, myself included, are very excited uh, to hear about it. Uh, just to provide a little context to some people watching right now, Kazusada Higuchi, straight up, just one of the best wrestlers in the world, period. Um, he had an excellent title reign as uh, the KOD Openweight Champion a couple years ago. Um, and this is an incredibly... I need to stress that this is an incredibly rare occasion for any fans in America. It's not just because you've just made your in-ring return, but also because when I spoke to Higuchi, I had the privilege of uh, interviewing him uh, about a year ago as well. He tells me he does not like flying. Um, that's just not something he really cares to do. So it's pretty massive that he's coming over to the States uh, to wrestle you, Chris Hero, uh, on your produce uh pro wrestling mixtape yeah yeah um <clears throat> yeah man just a a good old fashion we got to come up with a new word for slobber docker slobber docker is <laughs> kind of played but it's, it's the word slug fest and i'm not gonna say hoss fight you know i realize i just said it but i'm not gonna say that um just a, a meat and potatoes i said that earlier um and it's not just, um, you know, it's not just, you know, his chops and headbutts against my boots and elbows. Um, he's a very prideful wrestler. Um, and I know uh, when it comes down to it, he can be very disrespectful. Um, so I will not allow him <laughs> to disrespect me <laughs> sure, yeah. on my show. Yes. So I, you know, he doesn't like flying. Well, he's not going to like flying even more when he's flying back. Uh, <laughs> After taking a big L in Los Angeles at the Pro Rest Mixtape. He also has a notably very uh, sturdy skull, um, <laughs> um, which is quite an interesting challenge for someone uh, who is a knockout artist, if I must say so myself. Yeah, my uh, my short headbutt days are over. Uh, <laughs> I used to I used to really enjoy doing those. Mm -hmm. Um because for me, it was always risk versus reward, and you get a good clank on a headbutt, and I don't know, everybody can hear it, everybody can feel it, and it's just, it's sick, right? And I never, I don't know, they never hurt me, right? I was fine, you know, my, maybe, maybe my brain will falter at some point, uh, but I've, that was something I always had in my back pocket, whether I was wrestling Ian Rotten or I was wrestling Trick Davis or Eric Cannon or that that bum Kingston. I was always crack him in the skull. That was one of my fortes. But I think those days are those days are gone with uh, impact tests and concussion protocol and all that good stuff. And I, I'm really enjoying my physical health. You know, three years off uh, gave me a bit of a lease. Um, but yeah, there's there's plenty of ways to to hurt somebody. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to accept that challenge on your Twitch. Uh, the honor is all ours. Um, real quickly, um, you did mention uh, Ian Rotten there talking about headbutts. And in the past, you have said both to me uh, and just publicly how important and formative your time in IWA Mid-South was. What do you think it was about that promotion that helped you sort of develop your skill set as a young wrestler okay so it was three things that come immediately to mind uh, when i think about my time at iwa mid-south right um one was the consistency in which we'd run um you know i know they had um hiatuses here and there uh, but when i started working for iwa we were on every wednesday and saturday um, and then we'd you'd switch buildings and then, then it would be every Saturday or then a Friday, Saturday. So we were wrestling in front of the same fans consistently, you know, week after week that enables you to learn in a different way than just skipping around from town to town, to town, to town, to promotion, to promotion. Right. So number one is the consistency of, of shows, right? Number two is the 
length of time that he would give us in matches. Um, we had no business wrestling 15 plus minute matches, uh, but we <laughs> did them consistently. Um, and he would rather us kind of go a little bit longer and then kind of realize like, I mean, you don't know a match is too long until you've had one. And uh, unfortunately I've had many uh, matches that were too long. So I apologize <laughs> to everyone out there. Uh, but that does give you a feeling of, you know, what, what works and what doesn't, and it's always different. So you need those minutes um, that aren't crammed full of stuff. Right. Um, you know, if you have like a seven minute match um, and now you have 10 minutes, that doesn't mean, okay, now we need 10 minutes of stuff. It means take the seven minutes of stuff that you planned and kind of stretch it out and allow yourself to, to make decisions on the fly. Um, and it's, it's trial and error. You're not always going to hit a home run. Right. Um, so consistency is number one the actual time, the minutes, uh, that is number two. And number three is the variety. Uh, we had such a diverse locker room. We had guys that were, you know, were wrestling for USWA just a couple of years prior guys that had done tours of Japan guys that were currently in ECW. And then obviously when ECW folded, then we had ex ECW guys. Um, then you also had, uh, you know, a car from Chicago, uh, you had a car from from Pennsylvania. You had guys coming up from Tennessee. Um, just a lot of different people from a lot of different areas. Um, and that just that forces you to you can't just kick back and be comfortable because you can't have the same match with everybody. You have to learn how to work with different people. And yeah, sometimes you may think like, oh, man, I got to wrestle this guy like he doesn't want to do anything. Like, uh, And like, you know, sometimes that did suck. And then sometimes you learn the lesson by like, hey, you don't need to do everything. You can go out there and have a good match regardless. Um, and it's very important to learn to learn that. So uh, on those IWA Mid-South shows, we were provided with with a lot. Um, so it's just so, so many great memories. Um, so many lessons learned, uh, being on those shows. Um, so you mentioned all the veterans that come through Ida Bay mid South, and now you find yourself, uh, in the veteran role in most locker rooms, you're a coach at AEW. So I'm sort of curious, do you recall a piece of advice that you were given by a veteran, anyone in the locker room that you may have resisted at first and that you came around on perhaps whether it be immediately after you immediately regretted it or with time as you've sort of matured in your career yeah there are several pieces like that that come to mind and it's a tricky thing this pro wrestling right it um no matter how much you do it, uh, how much you live, breathe it, um, it's ever changing. It's always different. So you can't stick to your guns all the time. You know, more often than not, it'll work, but you just have to be flexible. You have to be malleable. You have to be shaped by the situation that you're in. One thing I heard uh, that I, it pissed me off at first. Um, just, I think maybe because of the way it was delivered, not necessarily the actual information. And it's something I've gone back on time and time again. Um, there's a difference between wrestling to get over and wrestling like you are over. Right. So what that means is wrestling to get over means I want to leave an impression on these fans uh, I want to end the match uh, being more popular, have a stronger connection. Uh, I want to, I want to make them feel something so that the next time they see me, they go, Oh, right. That's wrestling to get over uh, wrestling. Like you are over is kind of like playing something off your greatest hits album. Um, so you expect the fans to know what moves you're going to do. Uh, when you grab your finish, you expect them to go, Oh, it's his finish. Right. Um, when you send somebody to the corner and you do your, you know, you pose to the crowd for your little chant and you go and you come in, right? Like that is wrestling. Like you are over 
uh, and you really have to know the difference between the two uh, because I've done both incorrectly, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you call a match and it makes sense to you. It makes sense to your opponent. Uh, and then you go out and you do it and you realize that you're just right over the fans heads and not that they dislike it, but they just didn't enjoy it as much as they could have because um, you just, you just threw too much at them and expected them to know. Right. Um, how many times are you follow in a TV show? Right. And you watch it every single week, but still at the beginning of that episode, when they go previously on so-and-so you're like, Oh, okay. It connects dots and it's fresh. And Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Because the, the writers of that show know what's happening that episode and that you'll have to like, remember this guy showed up. remember this situation happened. And even last season, when this thing happened, like that stuff is very important because if the fans aren't clued into those things, um, the feeling when they watch it, it's just, they're just not going to get as much enjoyment out of it. Right. Um, and I think something like that doesn't hamper someone's enjoyment. If they do know it, it just reinforces what you're doing. Right. Um, sometimes we just overthink ourselves. We outthink ourselves. We try to do too much. We try to be too cute. We try to, okay, I did this last weekend. Well, let me do this with a twist. And then the week after that, you do it with two twists and whatever. And, but you're, you're not wrestling in front of the same crowd. You know, maybe people streaming are watching and they pick up on it, but we can't ignore the people that are right in front of us for the people watching at home. We need to come up with a way to do it so that it resonates amongst everybody. Right. So, that's that's one you know I could probably think of more but that's one that comes to mind you know there's a difference between wrestling like you are over and wrestling to get over um and one's good for one situation one's good for the other and then you also have to have the autonomy to choose which one of those works right in which situation and there's too much um just blindly following what people tell you like hey do this okay I'll do it but like, no, tell, they tell you to do it. They should give you a reason why, or you should know why. And then you have to take it yourself and go, I'm choosing to do this because of this. Right. I think in a lot of training schools, uh, especially a very large one um, that has a, the reputation it does. I think that's a problem that happens a lot where there are just people that are soldiers that just do what they're told, which there's nothing wrong with that. Do what you're told. But you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it in order to get the most out of it. Because if you're only ever following, you'll only ever be a follower. Um, and that works for some people. That's perfectly fine for some people. So there is no knock on that whatsoever. Some people have made a full career out of doing things one way. Um, but then there's also those, those outliers that are able to push themselves and get the most out of it. And you know what? Every now and again, they may have a stinker, but they can also push themselves to the point uh to the apex of of creativity and ex experimentation and then just give you something that you didn't even know you wanted but it ended up being the best thing and sort of on the flip side of that particular coin um is there a piece of advice you've been putting out there for young wrestlers um that maybe you wish would be uh heated a little more or just a particular piece of um valuable feedback you think uh would suit this current crop of wrestlers coming up in the world today uh one thing that i say i find myself saying this all the time um because especially with television wrestling time is at a premium um you could have six minutes and then it could cut down to three minutes <laughs> You know, well, shit, there goes half my time. And then what can you really do in three minutes, right? Aside from make it the best three minutes you can. Um, in those situations, everyone is so quick. When I say everyone, I'm not trying to put a blanket statement out there, but oftentimes people are quick to fast forward through their stuff and get to the good part, which is the false finishes and the the trades and the, you hit the ropes, he hits the ropes, uh, the, that kind of stuff. The exciting um, mind blowing stuff that the best wrestlers in the world are except exceptional at doing. Right. What I say to a lot of people is don't be afraid to wrestle. Don't be afraid to wrestle. Um, lock up, <laughs> grab a hold, 
wrestle just a little bit. Give me a, some <laughs> kind of a reversal, some kind of a takeover, some kind of a pin, and let the conflict develop from that wrestling. Then you can, then what you're doing is you're also not ding, ding, ding. Oh, fuck, you're off to the races. Now, some fans have to kind of keep up with what's going on. If you set, you set the table with a good lockup, you know, a little bit of this person versus this person. Um, I'm, I mentioned world of sport earlier, that European, that British wrestling. I love it so much because they were given so much time to let things develop. We don't have that luxury to let things develop in uh, a 20 minute television match with no stakes, right? That doesn't happen often. Um, but a little bit of wrestling keeps the fans honest. Let them sit there, let them watch, let them see things develop. And then that's when the personalities get into it. Um, a lot of these people start matches and they're so fucking pissed off already at their opponent. And it's like, <laughs> how did you get, how did you get so mad already? Like, let that develop. Let that simmer. It works for some people. Yes, it does. There's some people that have that personality. Or they have that history. Yes. But don't be afraid to wrestle. Um, and when it comes to getting better at the technique and the timing and, and whatever, just the confidence, like, you should find, find someone and get in the fucking ring. Roll around with them wrestle god we used to do this all the time back in the day and i attribute that to why i was able to learn so many techniques and be able to freestyle and come up with so many different things uh in creative interesting ways uh that whole crew um oh three oh four we would just get in the ring and wrestle and we wouldn't repeat things you know I, very rarely but grab a hold take over pin hold take over pin try this new thing i you know saw over the weekend and let me see if, if it works in practice and then you know you get a little blown up you get a little tired tag out here comes somebody else now you've got a fresh person in there to wrestle around with i think more people need to do that without hitting the ropes duck this oh my god duck this that's like the most ineffective thing in pro wrestling to swing a punch or to swing a clothesline because it gets ducked you know 99 times out of 100 right you know, that's a bit of an exaggeration but <laughs> um but that stuff is great it's great it's fun it's awesome but don't let that be your baseline let your baseline just be straight up wrestling and i know not everybody is a, a zach saber james mason technician that's okay be the wrestler that you could be um you can go back and watch some uwf wrestling and uh you can see someone throw Kamala in a hammerlock and take him down to the mat, right? <laughs> was that the best thing to do? I don't know, but you know, it was something that could be done. You don't have to just stick to what everybody else is doing. Um, and I love that we have somebody at the top of our company at the pinnacle of the business and Brian Danielson that loves to wrestle. So he actually gets in there and feels things out and wrestles and builds up to his stuff. He, his segments usually have enough time to kind of build to the point and, you know, unless there's some sort of a, issue built up you know he's not going to start swinging to taking someone's heads off head off until they've done something to deserve it um so you've been mentioning uh oh that was the sort of thing that you want to imp impart to wrestlers of this generation uh, i'm curious don't be afraid to wrestle yeah don't be afraid to wrestle <laughs> right i mean we we take it for granted oh it's pro wrestling right but then pro wrestling is you go to lock up and you give them a knee to the gut and you send them off to the corner and you start your shit right yeah and the keyword there is wrestling can, <laughs> yeah yeah and you know what let me shoehorn a thing in real quick for sure it's something something that i truly believe um you'll hear in if you've ever been around pro wrestling for any amount of time, you'll hear the phrase less is more, mm -hmm. right? You'll hear that a lot. And I understand the sentiment when people say it. Um, but I think that can be bullshit because where the, the energy, where that comes from a lot of the time, it's people trying to minimize people trying to, stifle people trying, you know, like, Oh, less is more like, and they it's, it can be very condescending. It's not all it, not, it isn't always, but it can be done in a very condescending way. Like don't these fucking kids know like less is more like, come on. Like, and then, you know, you have the young and impressionable. They're like, Oh my God, less is more. Wow. I never thought of it that way. And it's like, well, if you do less and it sucks ass, 
it's still going to suck no matter whether it's less or more. Right? <laughs> That's true. So, so my, my remix on that is get more out of less, right? So the thought process on that is a positive one. It's take what you're going to do and get the absolute most out of it. Right. So if you know what your finish is going to be a couple of false finishes, you want people to bite on your thread that you're going to weave throughout the story, a body part or, a, or some sort of a, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, some kind of a hubristic element in there. It's something that you're going to tell throughout the match. Like, okay, stick with that and build around it. Make it make it so that it's the best possible instead of all these forgettable things that just keep done. They're they're done and they're done and they're done and they're done. And then um, there's nothing. There's, there's a lot worse than this. But one of the worst feelings as a pro wrestler is getting a great, incredible reaction on a near fall. And then you realize that that should have just been the fucking finish. <laughs> and then you go to a finish that is okay. And it's not bad, but you're like, ah, oh, man, but you have to like stay tuned to that, be attuned to the situation where you have to go, all right, let's just fucking take it home now. Let's go whatever. And I've had the privilege to be able to do that a handful of times, but there's also more times that I just I overstayed my welcome a bit too long and, you know, you take those situations and you try to, you know, make them better in the future. Um, yeah. And I, I just wanted to ask, especially we've been talking about sort of uh, points of improvement, feedback you'd like to give. Um, but one thing I did want to ask is, are there any particular trends in ring that you've maybe noticed in the last decade or so, maybe the 2020s um, that you sort of look on positively that make you excited about the future of wrestling. Um, is there anything like that that sort of kept you on your toes and keeping you looking forward? Some guys and girls are just so creative. There are just some things that they come up with that are so simple that you think, wow, why didn't I think of that? It was right there in front of me the whole time. But like, man, ah, you know, I, I do love and appreciate the, the creativity. Um, and what, what I tr really try to do is I have my tastes, the stuff that I like, and I have the stuff that I don't love. Right. But I try to be tolerant of the stuff that I don't love that I can very clearly tell that other people love. Um, but then that just makes me, it fires me up when I see something like that. And I think like, ah, if they only would have a little more, more here done a little bit more here like it's good but like make it great like have that oomph in you to like make it great so i i do appreciate um the younger generation keeping us on our toes um because there there's a lot out there man gosh um i remember the first couple times i saw bandito wrestle and gosh he is just um Man, he's just very good. He's very good. He's very strong. Uh, he speaks fluent English. Uh, and, you know, once he comes back from his injury, man, he's just the sky's the limit. There is just untapped potential in that guy. Yeah, of course he can have good matches, right? A lot of people can have good matches, but someone like him, you're just like, where, how did he how did he come up with this? Or where did where did he put this together? Or why is he so goddamn strong? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Chris Hero, your show is this week. Uh, Chris Hero presents the Pro Wrestling Mixtape, also brought to you by West Coast Pro Wrestling. Is there any final things you would like uh, to share with us uh, about your show, what you've got going <laughs> on? Uh, feel free. The floor is yours. Well, I would like to, if you don't mind, I would like to announce one other match uh, for this upcoming show. Um... So it is official. Myself versus Kazusada Higuchi uh, will take place Sunday, April 14th in Los Angeles. Uh, we will be streaming live on YouTube. Um, we also, uh, you know, you can also buy tickets. Anything I post uh, over the past, you know, couple weeks, you can find links to those tickets. Uh, but another match uh, that is just right out of the back of my brain. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people that also like this style. Um, 
this one is going to be a very special match um, for me to watch. And I, I'm going to try to place it on the card so that I can be able to sit and watch and enjoy it <laughs> yeah. without being stressed about my skull being caved in at some point later in the day. <clears throat> um, this match will be a two out of three falls Yaveo masterclass challenge, and it will be Arez, student of Sky Day, my teacher, taking on Angelico, student of Negro Navarro. So two of the, the foremost maestros, especially of the Yaveo style uh, in Mexican wrestling, uh, two guys that have shaped generations of pro wrestlers. They send their protégés to Los Angeles April 14th. It will be Arez versus Angelico. Um, I'm very, very excited to see that. It's also two out of three falls. Um, so it will be a submission match, but not just any submission match. If you've watched uh, any T2P, uh, any of the Torimon 2000 project from the early 2000s, if you've watched any of guys like uh, Sol Solar, um, and I mentioned Hechicero earlier. He's also a great wrestler in that style. So it was important for me to give the spotlight uh, to a man like Sky Day, um, who's just taught countless of us over the years, whether it's myself, Claudio, Orange Cassidy, uh, just many, 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 many of us, Bandito even, um, to like shine a little spotlight on one of his protégés in Arez. And then, of course, Angelico. Holy cow. Uh, go scroll through his Instagram from the past couple years, and he has some one-on-one -on -one training sessions with Negro Navarro. Um, both Negro Navarro and Sky Day were hired by Ultimo Dragon when he opened his school, Torimon, Mexico, and, because he wanted guys to be able to wrestle. You know, he taught them how to take bumps, hit the ropes, lock up basic wrestling, but he also wanted them to learn the uh, the Mexican wrestling style, the Lucha Libre style. So he brought in a Technico in Sky Day and he brought in a Rudo in Negro Navarro so that you could learn different ways of wrestling. It's the same things, the same movements, but done a little bit differently. So two out of three falls, Yaveo, Masterclass Challenge, Arez versus Angelico. Folks, you guys all heard it for here first. Um, Chris Hero versus Kazusada Higuchi, uh, Angelico versus Arez in a two out of three falls submission match. That is at Chris Hero presents his pro wrestling mixtape, uh, West Coast Pro Wrestling, streaming live on YouTube April 14th. Uh, Chris Hero, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah, and and, and and before I go, yes. one, I have to, to thank you. Um, I appreciate all the work that you've put in over the years, um, taking something that you enjoy, but then also platforming yourself so that you can get, uh, you, you can get, uh, your, your thoughts out into the world of, of, uh, just these intricate stories of professional wrestling stuff. That's, it's hard to tell when you don't speak the language, right? What are they talking about? What, what's the story? Uh, but you've done a great job chronicling all this stuff and adding in your opinions here and there. You've built a great community, um, and I just also have to send my my love and thanks to everybody at West Coast Pro, uh, Scott Brigani. Um, he's just been so helpful to me in the past year and a half, um, pulling me out of the woodwork, um, giving me a spot behind the scenes to help uh, cultivate and create. Um, it just I've had countless um, weekends of just wonderful memories. You know, whether he's bringing Kenta Kabashi in or he's got Bull Nakano uh, or he has uh, Chigusa. Chigusa Nagaya's last match. Um, just and then also just some of the incredible young talent that I've been able to work with on the shows, at the shows, at the West Coast Pro Dojo. Um, it's just I'm so grateful and thankful to have been able to find a spot with West Coast Pro uh, and the dedication there to put good wrestling out into the world, but not just that, but to create and cultivate a pro wrestling in the Northern California area, the Bay area. Um, it's just very inspiring. So I appreciate my time with West coast pro. I'm glad that uh, I'm able to bring this mixtape out to the world. Um, d Joseph, do you know what, it, what the and one mixtape is? Or do you know what the reference is? I don't is? think I do feel free to fill me in there. Sure. Uh, and it's cool because, you know, there's an overlap, so it's cool to some, but it doesn't take away from other people's enjoyment. 
uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a brand called And One. Uh, And One is slang from basketball where you get fouled on a shot and you make the shot anyway, which means you go to the line for a free throw. So And One basically means like you tried to stop me. You could, you fouled me. You couldn't even stop me and one. Right. So it's screamed out passionately uh, throughout the heat of a, a basketball game. Um, st- the street ball culture, uh, especially of, of the East coast, New York city, whether it's Rucker park or, or whatever, they just had all of these incredible basketball players that did not quote unquote, make it for whatever reason, but you'd go to any court, you'd put NBA players there and they would get schooled by these guys. Um, and they all had nicknames. Uh, they all had these like special moves. So the brand and one started recording this street ball and putting it over hip hop music. And then they'd put the tapes out with, uh, you know, whether they were selling shoes or clothes or whatever. And these mixtapes became very popular. Uh, and then, you know, of course they were super bootleg at first, you know, where they didn't ask anybody's permission. They're just putting this stuff out there. But once the, the street ball players are kind of like, wow, we're becoming like mini celebrities because of this, um, they started putting out official mixtapes with official music and, you know, everybody had their own profiles and that's where you got a guy like hot sauce. Right. So that's why it was important for me to have hot sauce do the intro of hot sauce, Tracy Williams on the latest release. Um, you have guys like half man, half amazing skip to my Lou, the professor escalade. They all have their own gimmicks. Right. So in thinking about this show, I wanted that energy of like, wow, look at these guys from every corner of the globe uh, and look at some of the things they're capable of and look at their cool ass nickname. Right. So that's <laughs> the, the font. Um, the whole aesthetic of the show is a combination of like the and one mixtape. Uh, and then also the pro wrestling bootleg mixtapes that we would get back in the day, or somebody put a couple, three or four matches on a, a disc for you and send it to you. Um, so that's, that's really what I want this to be, man. I want this to be an introduction. I want you to leave the show going. I never saw that guy before that guy or girl. I never saw him before. And I think they're awesome. I'd love to see him again. Um, there's that, you know, these wrestlers, wow, I haven't seen them in years. I didn't know they were still wrestling. Let me see them. And then it's like, oh, this person's legit. Let me see if they can, you know, hold their own up against all these other elements. Right. So we got, you know, guys and girls from all over. I'm really excited for the show. Thank you for giving me the platform to talk to your, talk to your audience. But also you and I have discussed, you know, having some kind of a conversation at some point anyway. So I'm glad it just worked out. Uh, to this man. And I feel bad. You know, I used to be on Twitch. Um, (laughs) yeah, you know, people miss you. uh, Yeah. And I, I miss it too. It is just, it was just so time consuming. Um, and then I moved and that's, it's like, you know, you move and it's like, ah, the further away you get from something. And, you know, once I got started back on the road with AEW and that combined with my West coast stuff, I don't have as much free time as I would like. Um, so that's not to say that I will never, you know, obviously I haven't deleted my Twitch channel and I'm not going to do that, but as far as streaming regularly, it just, it made it very difficult, but I want to shout out to everyone that's participated in this chat. Anybody that's come along, anybody that's spread the word. Um, I just, I really, really do appreciate you. And I hope you can hear the sincerity in my voice. Um, it's been a long couple of years. It's been a hard couple of years. Um, but I do appreciate the support. It means the world. So to be here talking with Joseph, you know, I've spent many hours listening to your content (laughs) uh, to be helping promote a show for West coast. I've put countless hours in and they've entrusted me uh, so much in the last year and a half, so much so that I made my in-ring return for them. I'm, I'm just very happy and grateful and thankful. And I hope you all can check out the show, whether you watch it live, whether you watch it on delay, um, yeah, it means a lot. Chris Hero's Pro Rest Mixtape. Let's get it. That's happening April 14. Chris Hero, knockout artist, wrestling genius, coach at AEW, matchmaker at West Coast Pro. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's meant so much. Thank you, Joseph. Chat soon. All right. See you soon.